So good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Bagger. I'm the chief executive of the American Physical Society. And I must say, it's great to see you uh, all in the chat uh, already greeting each other. Uh, it's really a great sign for, for this conference. The American Physical Society is delighted to sponsor the 2021 Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics. Diversity, inclusion, and respect are core values that drive the APS mission, which includes providing a welcoming and supportive professional home for an active, diverse, and engaged membership. In fact, my first action as the incoming CEO of APS earlier this month was to sign the CEO pledge joining 1,600 CEOs from across the country, pledging to advance diversity and inclusion within the workplace. I firmly believe that there's strength in diversity and that physics needs each and every one of you. So we at APS are proud to have served as the institutional home for the QWIP conferences since 2012 and the society is committed to supporting QIP going forward. We have partnered with foundations and federal agencies to fund the conferences. And this year we recognize a significant contribution from the Heising Simons Foundation towards organizing this virtual conference, as well as support from our longstanding partners, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. So having just arrived back in the US from Canada, I would like to extend a special welcome to session attendees from the Canadian Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics, sponsored by the Canadian Association of Physicists, of which I remain a proud member. I would also like to acknowledge our other international attendees, especially those from Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil, who I hope and expect will bring the QWIP spirit back to their home countries by organizing similar conferences in the years to come. So in closing, I would like to thank you all for participating in this conference. We at APS appreciate the leadership that many of you have shown in organizing QWIP, while we also recognize your important contributions to physics. And so now I will hand the session over to Dr. Evie Downey, the past chair of the QIP National Organizing Committee, who will introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Mary James. Evie, over Good afternoon, you. everyone. Thank you very much for being here. QIP would be nothing without QIP attendees. And before I get on to the very exciting and honorable task of introducing our keynote speaker, um, I have a few logistical announcements for you. So those that have been at QWIP before know that right before the plenary talks is when we tell you where the vegan lunches are located and where the all gender restrooms are. We don't have to do that. Luckily, you all know where you have your snacks and where your bathroom is. But there are some things that we'd like you to note and to think about. So in this online QWIP, we wanted to make sure that you could still meet with each other, right? And still socialize and get to meet other physicists all around America and this year, very excitingly, all around the world. And so we're encouraging you to participate in the speed geeking. So those are the sessions where you go into Zoom rooms and are randomly shuffled every 10 minutes and get to meet all kinds of people just in the same way you do at the lunch queue or at the career fair, a regular queue whip. There are also some other opportunities to hear from each other. So tomorrow afternoon, there'll be lightning talks and those are talks by other attendees. So you get to hear the science that your other, other students in your cohort are doing and learn all about what's possible as an undergrad doing research. And there are all kinds of topics. So I'd really encourage you to look through the lightning sessions and lightning talks and pick one to attend if you're not speaking. And if you are speaking, thank you very much for making the effort to share your excitement about physics and your knowledge with the QWIP community. In addition to the lightning talks, we wanted to give you the opportunity to bug a speaker at coffee break. Right, so the way we always normally do at QWIP, you wander up and some of the best talks, some of the most inspiring things that happen in QWIP are not the organizations, it's the talking to someone in a corridor. It's the seeing someone speak and feeling inspired and be like, I have to ask this person about this later. And so we've tried to give you those opportunities in the speaker breakout sessions. These are a bit of a logistical nightmare if you're running an online conference because there's a lot of speakers, right? We have over 200 volunteers involved in running the, the QWIP in terms of, of breakout sessions and also speakers and panelists. 
And so for the speaker breakout sessions, what we're asking you to do is you'll see it on the schedule as a speaker chat session. You go into the one session and then once you get inside, you see this lovely view in Bravura of two escalators and a little notice board. You can scroll on that notice board until you see the name of the speaker you'd like to chat with, click on the link and just follow it into the Zoom room. And then you'll be in a regular Zoom meeting with the speaker of your choice, a facilitator and whoever else wants to chat with them. If there are many speakers that you want to chat with from a session, you can come out and go backwards and forwards and join different Zoom rooms and speak to different speakers. So I really encourage you to take part in that. And for the speakers, because of how the things are set up, there's a potential for you to access it through the speaker portal, but it will always work. If after your session is done, you just go into the speaker chat session on the speaker portal, uh, on the, sorry, on the attendee portal and just go to the Zoom room with your name on it. So as long as you go to the Zoom room with your name on it, you'll all be able to get to it. Okay, so after the session, click on speaker chat session and just pick the session that you want to be in if you're an attendee or if you're a speaker, pick the session with your name on it so that people coming to speak to you can find you. So with those logistical notes over and if people still have questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll try and answer them. Um, after the talk. Um, but it's my honor and joy and pleasure, and I'm very proud to introduce our second Sloan Foundation Endowed Millie Dresselhouse keynote lecturer. Our speaker today is Dr. Mary James. She enrolled at Hampshire College in Amherst in 1972, and after participating in a summer internship in Slack, ended up with a BA in physics from Hampshire College and joined Slack as a junior engineer. In 1988, she graduated from, from Stanford with a PhD in applied physics, and after a position as faculty at the University of Maryland, became a professor of physics at Reed Coll College in Portland in 1988. And 200, 2013, she was promoted to be Dean for Institutional Diversity, a role in which she still serves. In addition to all of her professional accomplishments, She's also a member, has been a member and a chair of the APS Committee on Minorities in Physics and the APS National Mentoring, involved in the APS National Mentoring Community. From 2018 to 2020, she served on the American Institute of Physics Task Force to elevate African American representation in undergraduate physics and astronomy, team up, and produced a report that's used by departments throughout the US. Dr. Mary James is a wonderful woman an incredible physicist and a great contributor to APS and her community at large. And I'd like to welcome her and invite her to share her talk with QWIP. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evie, for that lovely introduction. And I just wanna greet all of the participants. Um, I have to admit, I was a little bit um, uh, tense about speaking to you virtually um, because when I speak to a group who has come together, particularly in QWIP, um, I can see all of you and I can see the energy and enthusiasm that you, that you bring to the conference. So I get as much out of QWIP conferences as the participants, um, but seeing um, all the enthusiasm coming through the chat and the fact that I'm speaking to folks um, all over the United States, Canada, Mexico, and beyond. Um, I saw Brazil, Colombia, Paris, so um, thank you for putting, contributing to the chat just to you know, kind of raise my energy level and enthusiasm and know that you are all really there. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And, uh, and begin, I guess, the formal talk. So um, I wanna to talk to you today about access. Um, and what does access really mean? And in particular, we're gonna talk about what does it mean to have access to an education? Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, a few comments about myself and my own winding journey into physics. Um, so I'll begin by, let's see, um, begin by telling you that um, I grew up in a family with six kids and my parents were both philosophy majors in college. Um, and didn't have any particular burning interest in science or any um, technical acumen. They actually had appliance insurance. So Sears Roebuck would come and fix anything that broke in the house. Um, but I was always interested in science and always interested in how things work. And I remember when I was 12, I asked my 
mother for a book called The Way Things Work, um, from ballpoint pens to jet aircraft for Christmas. And she thought it was an odd request, but she was happy to fill it. Um, the time I was in high school, I started a lawn business and um, tried to fix the lawnmower myself. So this first slide is me trying to fix the lawnmower, but what actually happened was, actually I did fix the lawnmower, but first I set it on fire. Um, but luckily the fire went out quickly um, and a friend of mine and I were, were actually able to fix, fix the lawnmower. So um, I went to college. I, in high school, I studied physics. I took the one physics course available at the high school and um, continued to study physics in college. I was very curious about, um, continued to be curious about the way things work, um, maybe stretching my imagination a little to how to, how to stars work um, and how to atoms work. Um, but when people would ask me um, what I was going to do after college, I would think to myself, well, I'll need a real job. And so I would say, well, I don't know yet, but probably I'll go into medicine or law or engineering um, because I knew that those were actually, that those were jobs and those were things that, uh, that grownups did. So while I was um, in college, I had a professor um, and he came up to me one day and now I have to date myself. This is long before the internet existed. Um, and he came up to me and he had a, a paper brochure from the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center now called the, the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. And he said to me, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center has a program for undergraduates to do research in the summer and I think you should apply. And he handed me this brochure um, and it said the, the world renowned Stanford Linear Accelerator Center where the brightest minds in physics come to do brown, groundbreaking research, the two mile long accelerator blast electrons for use by the physicists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it said, and we're looking for the best and brightest undergraduates to come and work as uh, in our summer program. And I looked at this brochure and in order to apply, I would have needed to fill out the application and then put a stamp on it and send it to California. And I actually did the calculus and I said, my chances of getting into this program are so low that it is not worth the stamp. So, what my professor said was, you should apply to this program. And what I heard was, you should fly to the moon. That's how ridiculous the idea seemed to me at the time. And I didn't apply. Next year, I think I mowed lawns that summer. And then next year I came back and um, my professor just kept bugging me. He bugged me all year. He's like, Mary, Mary, I think you should apply to this program. I really think you should apply to Slack. Have you applied to the Slack program yet? And finally, really just to appease him, I said, okay, okay, I'll apply. And I sent in an application and I forgot about it. And about the time one would be hearing from summer programs, February or March, um, my professor started to ask me, have you heard from Slack yet? Have you heard from Slack yet? And I, I remember thinking, no, of course I haven't heard from Slack. Um, so unbeknownst to me, uh, my professor called Slack and and inquired about the status of my application. And the people at Slack said, oh yeah, we remember that application. Um, well, the student wrote where it said grade point average, they wrote not applicable. And we just didn't know what to do with that. Now I have to explain. I went to Hampshire College, which does not have letter grades. It has narrative evaluations. And so when I saw this little box, grade point average, I just wrote not applicable. So my professor came up to me and said, Mary, you can't just write not applicable in the little box. You have to explain that we have narrative evaluations. You have to send them your narrative evaluation transcript. I said, oh, oh, I didn't know any of that. And honestly, I can't remember that I actually did that. I think what, but a few weeks later, or yeah, a few weeks later, I got a letter in the mail and it said I had been accepted to the program. Now, I was totally, completely amazed. And actually what I think happened was that during that conversation with Slack, my professor really talked me up and that's kind of what um, uh, put it over the top. Although I, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, in a minute. 
Um, so now here I am, a kid from Chicago, um, when it was an amazing, huge journey to go to college 800 miles away in Massachusetts. I'd never been west of the Mississippi River. And now I had this opportunity to go to the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in California. So I had two competing thoughts about that. First of all, I'm picturing the program at this big national lab and being a summer student there. And for some reason, I get this image in my head that all the summer students are going to, are going to be assigned to sleep on cots in the basement of the computer building. So there I am, there, there's my imagination, there are the stairs down into the basement, and there we are sleeping on the cots. That didn't sound very appealing to me, and honestly, I have no idea where I got that idea. But on the other hand, it was in California, and California has beaches and sunshine and waves. And I thought, well, even if I have to sleep on a cot, I would get to see California and go to the beach. So I accepted the invitation to the program. It turned out that though I was worried, the other participants were fun and cool, or at least fun enough and cool enough in, um, on the Mary scale. And the staff was welcoming, but also really intimidating. I mean, these were, these were you know, these high powered scientists that the brochure had talked so much about. So one day, um, several of us summer students uh, went to the, the Slack cafeteria for lunch um, and once we got our food, we looked around and there were no tables available, although there was a fairly big table that had some extra seats at it. And so we meekly asked the people sitting at the table if we could, if we could share their table. And they said, oh, yes, yes, of course, sit down. And so, and they were, you know, very nice and introduced themselves and we introduced ourselves. So, well, welcome to Slack. And, and then they went on with their conversation and their conversation was about physics most of which I didn't understand, but they were really animated and really interested in talking about um, the results that they had and how they could interpret it. And they were going on and on. And sitting there at that table, I realized for the first time, I mean, if you'd asked me, I guess I would have known this, but I realized for the first time in a really visceral way that people actually did physics for a living. And I remember thinking, wow, this is amazing. These guys work at this big lab. They were all guys. These guys work at this big lab and this beautiful cafeteria overlooking the San Francisco Bay. And um, they've got houses and cars and you know they go on vacation. And I knew at least one of them had a boat because he had a picture in his office of the boat. And I thought, this is amazing. You can get paid to do physics. And then my very next thought was, I wonder if the taxpayers know about this. This is a pretty darn good gig. So I, um, with that, I went back to Hampshire and I realized, hmm, um, yeah, I'm gonna major in physics and then we'll just see what happens. I went back to Slack for a second summer as a summer student and then the person for whom I worked. Oh, I forgot to tell you a little bit about this person for whom I worked. I worked for him both summers, but the first summer, about halfway through the summer, I was, he was, I was sitting and doing my work and he came up and said, how are things going? And at some point in the conversation, he said, yeah, you know, I remember your application to this program and your job experience seemed to all be mowing lawns. And I remember thinking, this kid really needs a job. <laughs> so actually the lawn mowing business launched my career in physics. So um, I was hired as a junior engineer at Slack and um, one day there, and the building in which I worked, 200 men worked in the building. It was the Klystron Assembly Laboratory and some affiliated labs in which I worked. There were 200 men and three women working in this building. So when I entered, I was the third woman. There were actually maybe the fourth. There were two secretaries and one computer programmer and myself. So one day I'm walking through the halls and a technician comes around the corner from the Klystron labs and he had a big smile on his face and he says, oh, you, I've heard about you. And then he said, but I can't remember, are you a secretary or a prodigy? And, I, and he, he said this in the most friendly welcoming way. And I remember thinking, that's such an interesting choice. 
that he sees a woman in a physics lab and he says, there's only two possibilities here. One, she's a secretary, or two, she's God's gift to physics because how else would, why else would she be in the building? And that's really stuck with me, the idea that a man could be good at his job, maybe very good at his job, maybe great at his job, but he doesn't have to be the next Einstein to be in the building. But what the technician said to me was, are you a secretary or a prodigy? So after a year as a junior engineer at Slack, it started to dawn on me, it's like, hmm, you know, the people running the show are the physicists. And if I ever want to be in, a, um, you know, in a position where I'm uh, in charge of thinking about where projects go next, what's happening, I need to go to graduate school. So I applied to graduate schools and was accepted to MIT. And when I got there, it became very evident in the first couple of weeks that I really didn't have a strong enough background, having gone to a small liberal arts college, I really didn't have a strong enough background to successfully complete uh, the graduate level courses. And so my advisor simply said, he wrote four numbers on a piece of paper because all the courses at MIT were numbered. And he said, transfer into these. And I did, and they were the upper division core courses in the physics program at MIT, which I found very challenging, um, but successfully completed. Um, so what he had done there on that little piece of paper, and by the way, this was the only African-American um, professor in the MIT physics department at the time, and to which, and I owe him a great debt of gratitude. Um, what he had done was essentially create what is now called a bridge program. That is, there are now programs sponsored by the APS and, uh, college and universities all over the country for students who have studied physics as an undergrad and would like to continue, but don't have a strong enough background quite yet to, to, to start a full graduate course. And so I'm indebted um, to that, um, that advisor and to MIT for giving me that year um, in which I could strengthen my physics skills. I then transferred, um, and as Evie told you at the beginning, uh, did my graduate work back at Slack. Um, so, I want to talk a, a little bit about, um, I hope it's clear then that I didn't have this, you know, sort of wake up as a three-year-old and decide that I wanted to be a physicist um, and then doggedly proceeded to, 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 to go that path. Rather, I was really helped by a number of people who were in the right place at the right time in key moments in my development. And basically um, the professor at Hampshire and the professor at MIT acted as mentors. And then I also, and also my, um, my summer, summer advisor at, at, at Slack, they all acted as mentors. And so I wanna take a moment to think about what a good mentor does. And what a good mentor does is first of all, they take the student exactly where they are. So think about my professor at Hampshire. He comes up to me with a brochure, gives me this opportunity to apply to a program, hands me the brochure. And, um, and for many people that would have been, I gave that student that opportunity. I made them aware of the program. I handed them the brochure with all the instructions. I'm done, my job is over. But not my professor. My professor kept saying, I think you should apply. I think you should apply. And then when I didn't apply the first year, it would have been perfectly reasonable for him to say, this, this student's just not serious about physics, you know? They wouldn't even fill out an application and put a stamp on an envelope and send it to California. But instead, when I came back from my junior year, he just started in again. I really think you should apply. I really think this would be good for you. I think you would get a lot out of this. He, and, and his tenacity in what he was doing was he was imagining possibilities for me that I could not imagine for myself. And he understood that. He understood in my sophomore year, I literally couldn't imagine myself in this program. And by the, even when I applied, I really couldn't imagine myself in this program um, doing physics research. A good mentor also remembers that today is a good day to learn. So over the years, I've had students walk into my office and, and say in a sophomore course and say, you know, I know we study this as a freshman, and I know I should know it by now, but I, I, but I don't. And, and they really say it in a very confessional way. And my response is always, oh, 
the concept of moment of inertia, sure, you saw it as a freshman. And I'm not surprised that it didn't stick because you weren't applying it to anything. And now you are applying it to something. And so you need to understand this technique. And I said, so today's a great day to learn what moments of inertia are and how to calculate them because now they have context for you. So you're much more likely to remember what it is and why it's useful. And finally, great mentors teach students not to sell themselves short. So again, my professor at Hampshire, by just being so tenacious about trying to help me get into a summer research program, even calling the program and pleading my case. And I, I think that is probably what, what made the difference between getting in and not getting in. Um, he was really, he was trying to teach me not to sell myself short. So what I say to students now is if they're interested in applying to a program and, and I, I follow in my mentor's footsteps, I try to pay it forward and to say, look, apply to this program. What's the worst thing that could happen? The worst thing that could happen is you'll get a letter and, you, and they'll tell you that you're not in the program, but you're not in the program now. So you really lost nothing by applying to the program and not being accepted because you weren't accepted before you applied. Um, it's a little hard to get a letter, it's disappointing, but really your status hasn't changed. Um, and as also what I always say is don't reject yourself. So what I did as a sophomore and then by putting in kind of a half-hearted application almost as a junior is I was making the decision that I couldn't be accepted into the program. And so what I wanna tell you is there are people that are paid to reject you. So you don't need to reject yourself. Let them do it if they're going to do it. You just apply and feel good about at least reaching out and trying for the opportunity. Um, now I wanna talk about going back to the, the concept of access. And I hope you understood that, um, or nope, you didn't have to understand it. I can just tell you what the professor, at Hampshire and then the professor at MIT were doing for me was they were giving me a true access to education. That is, they were stepping in at pivotal moments and saying, what does this student need to succeed? And then doing everything they could to provide that. Okay, so I wanna talk now about um, the Texas, what it was originally called the 10% plan. And then I believe now it's 7% plan. And uh, so, and there's a wonderful article by, uh, by Paul Tuff about this plan called Who Gets In and Who Gets Through, um, and, and I can get, put references um, in, in the chat at the end of the, the talk. Okay, so anyway, let me explain the Texas 10% plan. Some of you are from Texas, so you're familiar with this. So um, back in the, uh, uh, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, um, the University of Texas at Austin, which is the flagship uh, state university in the state of Texas, um, was folks noticed that the, the enrollment, the undergraduate enrollment at Texas was primarily from um, the Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin uh, urban areas. And uh, most of the students attending the University of Texas, they had, you know, uh, uh, application process, and then you were reviewed, and then you, and they had a formula for, for who gets in. And um, the formula really um, privileged students from privileged backgrounds, students who went to strong, sub, mostly suburban or private high schools in the major metropolitan areas. So they were predominantly white, predominantly wealthy, um, and did not in any way reflect the state of Texas. And the state legislatures in Texas said, um, from all across the state said, you know, wait a minute, all Texans are paying to support the University of Texas in Austin and all of Texas children don't have access to this, to this excellent education. So what they did was they created the Texas 10% plan, which guaranteed admission to the University of Texas at Austin to the top, to students in the top 10% of their high school across the state of Texas. So this was, really inter this was a really interesting thing to do and a very interesting um, uh, collaboration of, of legislatures um, got this law passed. 
basically who was being left out were students from the inner cities, um, mostly brown and black students from the inner cities of the large metropolitan areas and rural students, both black and white. And so an odd collaboration when we think about today's politics of rural white legislatures and brown and black urban legislatures together because their students weren't being admitted to the University of Texas at Austin given the, the existing admissions policies created this law. So now all kinds of students who had never, who had previously not had access to the University of Texas at Austin, and again, had never imagined themselves there, were told um, you're in the top 10% of your class, or now, as I say, the top 7% of, of the class, you can go, if you wish, you can be admitted to the University of Texas at Austin. And so this was really successful. And they started admitting many more students from much more diverse backgrounds. However, as Paul Tuff pointed out in his article, getting into the University of Texas at Austin and graduating from the University of Texas at Austin are two completely different things. And so he looked into um, the students who were being admitted from uh, rural and inner city schools and saw that their retention rate was very, very low. So they were being admitted to the institution, but they weren't, um, they weren't graduating. And then he tells the story of a particular student, um, a young Hispanic uh, woman from um, San Antonio, who um, first generation to college, her parents um, had immigrated to the United States, uh, had um, grade school level educations, and now they had a daughter who had been spectacularly successful in, um, in her studies in elementary and high school and had this opportunity to go to the University of Texas at Austin. So um, the student um, applies, is accepted, enrolls, and then travels 200 miles incredibly far um, for, for her um, to the university. And about five weeks into um, her her first semester at um, UT, um, she calls her mother in tears and says, um, I failed my first chemistry exam. She wanted to go into a medical profession. I failed my first chemistry exam. I have no friends. I'm absolutely miserable here. Um, I don't, you know, I just, I just don't know what to do. This isn't working. And the mother says, come home. You know, why are you doing this? This you know, you could be home, you could be with us, you could get a job. And, you know, why are you making yourself so miserable? Why are you doing this? And when I read this, I thought about my own daughter beginning college a few years back um, and having a very similar conversation. So she called and she was in tears and she said, you know, mom, I just got back my first paper in my writing class. And the TA said, I didn't even understand the prompt. And she's really upset. And I said, okay, well, tell me about this. You know, well, you didn't understand the prompt. Oh, you have an opportunity to rewrite the paper. Oh, that's good. Um, so have you been to the writing center? You know, they've got a fabulous writing center at your school. They got PhD English people in there helping students learn to write. And if you went in there and said, I didn't even understand the prompt, they would weep with joy that you were coming to them at the beginning of the writing process rather than the day before the paper was due. And I, you know, so what was I doing? I wasn't saying, come home. I was saying, hang in there. This will work out. Here are strategies to move forward. But was I in any way a better mother than the mother in Texas who had a distraught child on the phone and had the option to come home? No. She's been an equally good and caring mother. And I was being, I think, a caring mother. I guess I was saying for my kid, don't come home. But, um, and, but our, our identities, backgrounds, and lived experiences were so different that we could provide. So in a sense, from home, I was providing access to a higher education to uh, my daughter. And the other mother wasn't in a position to be able to do that. And so, um, um, particularly one chemistry professor at Austin said, we have to do more for these students. We owe them an opportunity um, to, to, scaff, to, to start with the skills they have today and help them 
develop more and more skills to be successful. And so he started a, a, a now quite famous program in um, introductory chemistry where um, students um, can opt in to have considerably more support, particularly in the, in the very first semester class so that they can go on and um, achieve their aspirations to, to move into um, fields that require chemistry, particularly medical fields. Okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about one of the thing, one of my themes in working as the Dean for Institutional Diversity is to try to convince particularly professors, but others who work in higher education that we think as teachers that when students walk into our classroom, they're all walking into the same classroom. And one of my messages is that that's not true, that students are walking into very different classrooms because they bring their identities, their backgrounds and lived experiences into the way. So when we think what we need to do is we all the students walk into the room and they're looking to us for wisdom and content, we need to deliver the content in a clear and accessible manner. But there are things in the way of, of, of students participating in the project that we think that they're ready to undertake. And these things um, are not strictly acad academic in the sense of we're not talking, I'm not talking at the moment about academic preparation, you know, did you take pre-calculus so that you're ready for calculus, that kind of thing. But rather um, social psychologists and uh, social and cognitive psychologists um, and have, um, looked at what it, it um, um, what kinds of obstacles um, might students face as they're joining the learning community, and I think all of these are particularly salient when you're joining a, a learning community like physics. And I'll talk a little bit more about why physics um, and a few other disciplines are uh, particularly difficult in this way. So um, the social scientists have identified. Uh, four things that I think it's important for you as students to be aware of. And I wanna say before I discuss these, that there's no pathology here. These are um, healthy reactions to situations by healthy people. Um, so we're not talking about you know, um, it, uh, students with vulnerabilities to mental health, although they also experience all of these um, and, and, and maybe coming at them from a more precarious position. So. The first is imposter syndrome. What's imposter syndrome? So I think you've probably all felt this. You, maybe in your first physics class, you sit down and you look around and there's whatever, 25, 50, 100, 500 people, depending on the size of the university you're doing. And they all look like they know what they're doing. And you think, you know what? Um, I had just heard the first lecture. Um, I didn't understand everything. Um, all these people look like they know what's going on. I, me alone, I am the admissions department's one mistake. I never should have been admitted to this school. I never should have been admitted to this class. I'm an imposter. It turns out that imposter syndrome is extremely widespread and particularly widespread among um, marginalized groups in any particular undertaking. So in an uh, and underrepresented group, so in physics, that would be women and other gender minorities, um, students of color. Um, uh, so imposter syndrome, everybody feels it. Folks from marginalized groups feel it more intensely. And what's important about it is it's undermining your confidence even before you start to engage in an activity. And if that activity turns out to be challenging, instead of saying, wow, this is really challenging and so I need to marshal my own and maybe some outside resources in order to meet this challenge. You say, what happens in your brain is you say, this is proof that I am an imposter, okay? The next is stereotype threat. And stereotype threat was developed by a number of researchers, but particularly Claude Steele. Um, and he has a wonderful, um, uh, uh, a book called Whistling Vivaldi. And I can tell you what that title means in a minute. But the basic idea of stereotype threat is that we hold a number of identities. Um, we hold an identity with respect to gender, with respect to sexuality, with respect to race, ethnicity, age, 
um, religious affiliation, citizenship, um, et cetera. So all of these identities position us in society in ways that we really understand. Um, so we know along each of these axes of identity, whether we're in the dominant group, that is the group that is seen as the universal of whatever that identity is, and then the, the marginalized group, which is seen as the other. And it's the dominant group's preferences and proclivity, proclivities that, as the name implies, dominate social expectations. So um, we are aware of the stereotypes attached to, to some particular aspect of our identity. Um, and what I love about Claude Steele's book is um, he talks, he gives lots of examples. And so, and so he gives the kind of obvious examples like women aren't good at math kind of thing. And that's a stereotype threat that in particular that this group might bring to their studies in physics and mathematics. Um, but he also talks about other forms. So he talks about a young man at the University of Michigan. He's in his junior year and he's just crushing the University of Michigan. He's really, he really loves it. He's really good in his classes. He always does the work, he participates. He writes papers that his professors like. And so he's just rolling through Michigan, just doing it, having a good time and doing a great job. And then in his junior year, he decides to take, he's, a, he's white um, and he decides to take an African-American studies class. And he walks into the room and there are 30 students in the room, 28 of which are African-American. So there's this he and one other white student. And right away, he feels his stomach tighten and his hands, you know, his hands get kind of clammy and he realizes his whole body is filled with tension. And, he, and then he looks around and he realizes that all of the black students are really comfortable in the space. They're sitting, on, they're sitting on the tabletops and relaxing in the chairs and chatting with each other. And they, you know, he, and, and he just, he's just really aware of uh, being a social outsider in this environment. And then he has a little conversation, and then he wants to leave. He just thinks, mm, maybe not, maybe I'm not taking this class. And then he has a little conversation with himself and he says, oh, this is the way the black students feel in all the other classes. You know what? This is good for me. I should you know, sit with this discomfort and, and, and I should take this class. I think this is a good experience for me not to be in the majority, not to be in the dominant group. So he does, he takes the class, but he never talks. And so Claude Steele is interviewing him and he asks him, so why didn't you talk? Why, why didn't you participate? You participate in all your other classes. And he says, well, I was afraid that if I made a statement, I might say something wrong and people would think that I'm a racist. And if I asked a question, People might think, I can't believe he doesn't already know that. And they would think I'm clueless. And so he had done a mental calculus that to speak up in this class, he would be representing not himself, but his group. And he stood the chance of um, confirming stereotypes about his group, confirming stereotypes that, that whites don't know anything about African-American history that whites are, whites are insensitive and say racist things. Stereotype threat, so now I'm gonna tell you a story much closer to home about stereotype threat. Um, a few years back, uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a meeting on my calendar and there was a name there, but I didn't recognize the name. So I asked my assistant, um, I have a meeting with someone at three o'clock. He goes, oh yeah, that's a student. Um, who, they called and they just said they wanted an appointment with you, but they didn't tell me what it was about. So at three o'clock, this wonderful, radiant young woman walks into my office and she says, she stands there kind of like, you can tell she's kind of like um, really prepared for this moment. She said, hello, Professor James. And, and this time I was work, uh, working full time as a Dean for Institutional Diversity. So I was on leave from the physics department. And she walked in and she said, hello, Professor James someone told me that there was a woman of color physicist on this campus and I just needed to meet you. And so I said, well, welcome and come in and sit down and tell me about yourself. And so she's telling me about herself and she was a freshman, um, an international student from Malaysia. And 
Um, she said she was studying physics. Um, and then she told me this little story that had happened to her earlier in the week. She said, you know, Professor James, I was in conference, um, which is our, um, our, our small work sessions for physics students. So they go to lecture three times a week and then they go to conference once a week for an hour and a half and, uh, and work on things in smaller groups with a professor. So anyway, she was in conference and she said, um, the professor had sent us to the board in groups of three to work on a problem. And my group was me and, and two white men and I was holding the chalk and I was about to start working on the problem. And the two men were over each of my shoulders looking at the board. And all of a sudden, all I could think about was the fact that if I messed this up, these men were gonna think that women couldn't do physics and women of color especially couldn't do physics. And then she said, I know that's not what I should have been thinking about, but it's what I was thinking about. And this was a perfect example of stereotype threat. There she was interested in working on physics, but her cognitive, uh, her cognitive load was dealing with this other problem. And what she was saying, what this, her cognitive load was saying to her was, you, you stand at the precipice of confirming negative stereotypes about groups to which you belong. And that is a very high price to pay for working on this problem. And so instead of thinking about the problem, she's thinking about the problem of reinforcing stereotypes for these two white men who are, who are standing over her shoulders. And then she puts another layer on it. She actually says, I know that's not what I should have been thinking about. So not only is she thinking about um, the possibility of confirming negative stereotypes about her group, but she's also at the same time judging herself for thinking about it. And so it's been shown that stereotype threat can really um, impede cognitive performance just when you need your cognitive performance to be at its highest level, when you're presenting, um, when you're taking an examination. Okay. Belongingness uncertainty is different yet from imposter syndrome and stereotype threat. And this is the sense that you are welcome in a community and that you belong to that community. And so the classic, um, the classic uh, psycho psychology experiment around um, belongingness uncertainty was um, the, the researchers uh, at a large university looked at the, the grades from an introductory computer science course over the, the last semester. So it's an introductory computer science course. And they looked for all the women in the, cor in, the, in the course who had done very well. So I don't know, A's and B's in this course. Um, and, um, and then they asked them if they would come and fill out a short survey. And the survey was about whether or not they were going to consider computer science as a major. And they had half of the women take this survey in, and the room in which the women took the survey was introduced to them as the computer science lounge. So come to the computer science lounge and fill out this survey. So for half the women, the computer science lounge um, was decorated with um, very, very neutral um, kinds of, 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 um, of decoration. So, um, posters with um, waterfalls and um, gorgeous forests and mountains and stuff. So basically kind of um, scenery, uh, pretty neutral outdoor scenery. And the second room in which half the women took this survey was, and, and this was the, they were told this was the computer science lounge, was filled with gamer posters. Um, and um, World of Warcraft stuff and Lord of the Rings stuff. and. So, and so basically reinforcing the idea that people who do computer science um, are gamer boys and World of Warcraft and Lord of the Rings and all, all that kind of stuff. And they found that the women who took it in the neutral environment, so the only thing that was different was the posters on the wall. The women that took it in um, the neutral environment were statistic, very statistically significantly more likely to say, yes, I'm considering a major in computer science than the women who took the survey in a room that spoke to them of people who major in computer science are um, gamers who, I know, and I know there are women who game, but they're overwhelmingly men. And so that didn't have anything to do with the women's ability or even their sense of their ability, but that had to do with 
the sense of everything that we do is a social undertaking, even if we don't think of it that way. And I don't fit here socially. I, I don't belong to this community. Okay. And then finally, I think the most, and, and finally and most importantly, um, what can be in our way of um, taking on challenging things and, um, and, and having the tenacity and resilience to complete them is this idea of a fixed mindset. So let me explain a little bit about that. You may have heard about this already. Um, uh, Carol Dweck what pioneered this research at Stanford University. And basically the idea is that um, in, in, in any undertaking or any sphere of our lives, we can have either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. So what is a fixed mindset? So a fixed mindset says that attributes um, that are, uh, that attributes are fixed. That is, um, that other attributes are like having a left leg. Either you have a left leg or you don't have a left leg, but wanting to grow a left leg isn't going to make it happen. It's a fixed attribute. Okay. So what other things might or might not be fixed attributes? Well, one of the big ones that we talk about a lot is intelligence. Is intelligence a fixed attribute? Well, first of all, there are no good definitions of intelligence, so it's a little bit squishy already. And then is this something um, that you can grow or is this something that's fixed? And so rather than using the word um, uh, intelligence, you know, we, we could say something like maybe intellectual facility or intellectual acumen or something like that. Um, anyway, so if one holds a fixed mindset, that is, the day I was born, I was as smart as I was ever going to be, and I'm still that smart, but no smarter. Um, and I don't even like the word smart, but we're going to use it because that's what people, that's what people, including myself, think about. Okay. Then what is education? What is the, you know, what is the enterprise of education? If you hold a fixed mindset, the enterprise of education is not to teach and learn and grow. The enterprise of education is to sort. So from kindergarten on, and many of you have heard this throughout your lives, you, the, the, in, the tacit assumption is that what we're really doing in education is sorting people. We're sorting people into the smart box and the not smart box. And so at each stage, it gets a little bit harder to get sorted into the smart rather than the not smart. So many of you had the profession that people would tell you, uh, during your uh, formative years, um, elementary school, high school, oh, you're so smart. And we reward people for being smart, not doing something, but being something. So if, if this is an attribute that we have at birth and all that we can do is either reveal it that we have it or not reveal it, then, then that's how we perceive the educational process. I'm, I'm about to get sorted. I'm about to take another test and get sorted another time. And I have to get into that smart box. That's where I want to be. I'm going to do everything I can to stay in the smart box. That's the fixed mindset. As opposed to a growth mindset, if you have a growth mindset about something, and by the way, it can be you, individual people can hold both fixed mindsets and growth mindsets about things. I have a growth mindset about my ability to learn and grow as, a, you know, in, in mathematics, in physics, in quantitative fields, statistics, these kind of things. And I have more of a fixed mindset about my ability to um, make music or, you know, I say, mm, I don't really have, I'm not really musical. I don't have musical acumen or um, uh, so, um, so if you, if one instead has a growth mindset, then one believes that one can take an attribute that you have and make it stronger, make it better so that you can actually like lifting weights. So we do it. Yes, we all have a certain muscle mass and we're not, most of us are never going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. But if I lift, lift weights consistently, I will get stronger. And I will, and, and if I get to uh, plateau at some place where I feel strong enough, I have to maintain, I have to continue to lift weights to, to maintain that strength. But I really do have more strength than if I hadn't done that. And so I believe that our minds, our, brain, our brains, the neuroscience says so, and our brains and our minds 
we have the to blow to so whatever that thing is that we're measuring, um, we um, uh, whatever that thing is we're measuring, we can actually improve that. Okay. So if you're in a growth mindset, then you can approach challenges and setbacks and failures. You can say, ah, there's something I can do about that. As opposed to if you're in a fixed mindset, you go, yep, I moved to the um, I moved to the level where. Sorry, I just said my internet connection was unstable, but I'm hoping you're still there. Um, um, that I've moved to the level where um, this is really challenging, and now I might need to think about other strategies to um, to meet this challenge. Um, so, um, so your fixed mindset. Um, so, I'm, obviously, I want to encourage you not to think anymore about the smart box and the not smart box. That's not what's important. What's important is, and I hear I'm declaring to all of you, if you are at the QWIP conference, if you are studying physics as an undergraduate, you're smart enough. So just say to yourself, I'm smart. That are gonna make the difference um, but if, if you wanna continue to pursue physics or anything else that's, that's, that actually really challenges you, that moves you into um, um, what my, colleague of mine in psychology calls constructive discomfort. Constructive discomfort is that discomfort you feel when you're moving from one paradigm to another. And the neuroscience of it is you actually have to let some neural pathways in your brain atrophy and other neural pathways in your brain strengthen. And when you're halfway between those, you feel literally viscerally in your body, you feel discomfort. So what's an example? An example would be going from an Aristilian, Aristilian Aristotelian notion of um, motion, you know, that things just have their rightful place. So heavy things go down because heavy things should be on the bottom and light things like fire go up because light things should be at the top. Things just want to get back to their place to a Newtonian view of motion. Um, and that that's actually, that's actually a hard transition to make because the Aristotelian view actually works really well, just walking around. And that's, if you haven't been trained in physics, that's probably your view of how motion works. Okay, so that discomfort that you feel in deep learning has to be there as you move from, from one set of neurons um, holding your worldview about that thing to this, this other set, this new set. But we can misinterpret that discomfort as belonging uncertainty, stereotype threat, um, imposter syndrome, fixed mindset, we can say, this horrible feeling in my body as I'm trying to learn this thing is confirmation that I really don't have what it takes to do this. It's confirmation that I don't belong. It's confirmation that I'm an imposter, et cetera, et cetera. We stay in a growth mindset and say, this is hard because it's hard. <laughs> and now if I can't make progress by myself, I'm gonna to talk to my friends, I'm gonna to talk to a tutor, I'm gonna to talk to my professor. I have strategies for moving through the challenge. Now, your, whether you have a fixed or a growth mindset, that matters a lot. And you, have, and you have some control over that. In fact, you have complete control over that. However, other people's minds, fixed mindsets also affect you. So it's just important to understand that. So here is, um, a, um, and I'm sorry I didn't attribute this, uh, it's a paper on, um, on the belief on brilliance. Well, let me just explain what this is. So um, this, on the horizontal axis here is now, remember, this is about beliefs, not about facts. This is about beliefs. Is the number, the number into, we've, they asked people who are practitioners in these fields, if they believed, basically they're measuring fixed mindset. If they believe if there's just natural brilliance to be successful in this field, do you just need natural brilliance? And so if you notice, so mathematicians believe that, that you have a gift to do math. They believe it most strongly. Physics is next, engineering, computer science after that. And then those, who, those in, in the sciences who don't hold that mindset nearly as strongly would be in the earth sciences, neurosciences, molecular biology. That's the way to read this graph. 
So that is graphed against the percentage of US PhDs who are women, okay, who, are, who identify as female. And look, so look at this very strong correlation. If practitioners in the field believe that you just need some sort of innate natural brilliance to succeed in this field, women are much less likely to earn degrees in those fields. We're in fields where people believe and have, so, so people to the left on this graph or um, uh, uh, disciplines to the left on this graph, the partic practitioners of the, those disciplines believe that you can, that you can grow, um, that, you can, uh, that you can grow and um, increase your intellectual acumen by learning and doing. Now, it's pretty interesting to me where neuroscience falls on this graph and makes, and, you know, makes me happy. It's like, so neuroscientists, the people that actually study the brain and the mind and the connection between the two, they believe that you can learn and grow and get better at something, that you can actually grow your intellectual acumen. And there are a lot more women um, who, who um, are receiving PhDs, almost 50%. And look at molecular, molecular biology. Like, I don't know a lot of molecular biology, but I know it's no picnic. It's not like anybody says, oh yeah, that's a gut major. Um, and they believe um, that you can grow, that you can actually strengthen your intellectual ac acumen as you grow and learn. Um, and the practitioners in that field are, um, the, the PhDs granted are over 50%. So, and I want to show you another slide. Okay. Again, the, um, the x-axis or the horizontal axis is, again, belief that the practitioners in those fields have that, um, uh, and I'm just about out of time, so I will um, finish up very, very soon, about two minutes. Um, belief that the practitioners have that you just need an innate brilliance in order to be successful in that field. And now we put in a lot of non-science fields. And then again, the percentages along the um, uh, vertical axis are percent of, of US PhDs who are African-American. Okay. Notice there, where's physics? Well, physics is um, bet between 4.2 and 4.7. It's about the fifth highest um, field in belief that you need innate brilliance in order to succeed in the field. But look at the other things that are out there. I mean, you know, and philosophy, classics, music composition. So, um, you know, we're physicists and, you know, I don't have anything against the philosophers, but really they believe intensely that you need a native, there's some sort of native brilliance that you have to be born with. To, to, to succeed in the philosophy field. And guess what? They have very few members of their, their the numbers of PhDs, African-Americans who are earning PhDs in philosophy is 3%. Um, physics is, is even lower, but there's this strong correlation between whether or not the practitioners of the field believe that you have to have some sort of innate intelligence and the number of marginalized people who are earning members of marginalized groups who are earning PhDs in those disciplines. So the, generally speaking, this graph makes me pretty sad, but there is one bright spot, namely that people who, who are getting PhDs or are experts in education, as you can see, educators at least believe that you can become more intellectually acumen with, by learning and growing. So that's a relief at least educators don't think they're in the sole business of sorting. And what it really means to be at the right on this graph as a possession means that you really do believe that, you're, that a great part of your mission is just to sort. And if, you think, if you're an educator and your mission is to sort, in my opinion, you're a really lazy educator. You, know, you just say, well, I'm just here to decide who has this innate ability and who doesn't. I'm not actually here to help people grow and increase their um, intellectual acumen. Okay, so what does it mean to, to carry a fixed mindset, particularly about your studies in physics or anything else? 
A fixed mindset really leads to fear. That is, you're always afraid that you're gonna get sorted into that not smart box. If you carry a growth mindset, then what you're doing is summoning courage. You're saying, this is hard, but there's, but I am growing in this process, even if it doesn't feel that way viscerally right now. And so what I wanna do is, um, is marshal resources. What are the other resources I need to increase my intellectual abilities and acumen around say math and physics? So what are the other things you need is savvy. And that means taking advantage of all the resources at your, at your, at your um, disposal. Tenacity, hanging in there. And then resilience, realizing that a setback isn't the same as I'm never going to do this. I got to tell you, it did not feel good after two weeks at MIT to walk into my advisor's office and say, I'm just completely overwhelmed. I'm out of my depth. And luckily, he was there with the safety net. And he said, OK, don't take those classes. Take these classes. That was a setback of some kind, but it was exactly what I needed to continue to do something that I was passionate about. So. Finally, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, for a minute, about the upside of entitlement. So we usually think of dominant groups as feeling that they're entitled to things. And they do. Um, and I want to say it, it can be off-putting, but it's not all a bad thing. You really are entitled to form a study group, to ask other people if you, they would like to study with them. You're entitled to use tutoring. You're entitled to go to office hours. And you should embrace those entitlements. These are things that are important for my success. This is academic savvy rather than innate intelligence. I need to, I need to use the resources that are available to me um, and to, in, in order to do this thing I'm trying to do. Inevitably, as a woman in physics, sooner or a member of gender minority, sooner or later, someone's going to say to you that you got something, quote, because you were a woman. You got into a summer program. You got into graduate school. You got a, a research opportunity with the professor. Whatever it is, some accomplishment on your part is gonna be denigrated by someone and they're gonna make some quip about. So I invite you to arm yourself. Maybe you can put them in the chat with some snappy comebacks when people say those things. Um, because there's no upside to those things. Those are, those are just meant to, um, make the person who's saying them feel better about themselves in some way by kind of reminding you they're a member of the dominant group and you're not. And so um, if someone says, oh, you got into that grad, you know, you got into grad school because that, that program because you're a woman, you can say, you know what? That really explains it because I never finished the fifth grade. So come up with some of your own, um, but what you really want to do is something a little, little snappy um, that says how absurd their comment is. Okay, it's also mean, but you could go with the absurd side unless you want to unless you want to um, uh, confront the mean directly. I want to tell you just this final closing story um, about a woman who attended QWIP maybe five years ago, and I was the keynote speaker at one of the local um, QWIP conferences in the Pacific Northwest. She had come to my talk. And she sent me this email a few months later and she said, you know, Professor James, I wanted to thank you because after I heard your talk, I was, I go to, um, uh, I think she was at, uh, she said, I'm uh, at a, mount, uh, a state school in the mountain states, um, not a very well-known school. And um, so I had decided to apply for summer internships just to other uh, schools in the state and the region, in the, in the uh, Intermountain West because um, I didn't think anybody else would have heard of my school. Um, but then after your talk, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to apply to some other programs. And then she said, and I got into the program at the, um, uh, at the Smithsonian Astronomical Institute at Harvard. And I was just blown away. And I thought, oh my God, I'm so glad Professor James told me to just, just you know, stretch myself and apply for some things. And she was really excited about getting accepted to this, to this program and to get to travel and spend the summer at Harvard. And she's really excited. And she told a couple of her classmates about this. And right away, someone said to her, oh, you got into that program because you're a woman. And she said to me, she wrote, Professor James, 
I did not let him steal my joy. And so I want to leave you with that thought. Do not let others steal your joy. You're doing this. And here at QWIP, you're being celebrated for doing this. And I too celebrate you. Finally, I just want to state that um, as um, Jonathan said, as we introduced this, that this conference is complicated um, and requires enormous number of resources to put together. But the American Physical Society, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, know how important these skills besides your mathematics and physics skills are, but the skills in understanding um, how to proceed in the discipline as a social enterprise, which it is. Um, they know these skills and attributes are important, and that's why they sponsor and support the QWIP conferences. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it back over to Evie. Thank you very much, Dr. James. I'm sure if we were in the hall of QWIP, you would hear raptors of applause at this point in time, because the chat is going wild. So before we go into the Q&A, though, I wanted to answer some comments that came up in the chat. Um, <laughs> Sorry, the chat's going nuts on my side. Um, one of the things that the student said is they really want to listen to your lecture every week. And so before we do the QA, I want to remind the students that you can indeed listen to Dr. James's lecture every week if you join APS Engage. So APS Engage is free. You've had the information in many of the emails that have been sent to you, all of the slides, all of the material, all of the talk recordings are going to be available there. So if there's an extra side panel that you missed because you were somewhere else, you can go back and you can hear it and you can listen to Dr. James every Monday morning to pep you up before quantum mechanics. And I, I think that would be a great prescription for success. <laughs> so let's start with the question. So one of the, the questions that came up that I think you probably answered fairly simply is Carly Chichoki asked, what were the titles of the bridge courses? So if students are interested in the bridge courses, how can they get access to that information? Oh yeah, um, bridge programs. So um, um, uh, Jonathan might be able to answer this better than myself, but um, go to the APS website. And I think just try typing in um, bridge programs, that might do it. Um, I, uh, so, um, there are a number of them, but the American Physical Society um, actually has inv invites institutions um, to apply to be vetted um, so that students that are applying to the programs that have been vetted by the, by the APS um, know that those programs are ready not only to accept students, but also to mentor them and to really help them succeed. They've, they've set up, um, you know, um, uh, deep support services, uh, services isn't the right word, but the deep support structures for the students. So go to the APS website. I think that, yeah. Okay. So there's a comment from Lily Vida Robenthal, and she says that she goes to Evergreen State College, uh, which also doesn't give grades. And yep. she's finished applying to grad school and is a bit concerned that the lack of grades might be a detriment. Did you find that, that situation an obstacle to your journey? And can you give tips to other people who may be in a similar situation? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, don't do what I did. <laughs> I'm just right, not applicable in the little box. So you really want to explain that Evergreen has a narrative evaluation system and that you have a transcript with those narrative evaluations and maybe just send the transcript, even though they didn't ask for, for the transcript. Um, also, Graduate schools, more than students realize, are really looking for people who um, are enthusiastic and have potential in research. So, um, if you, you know, I think that's going to be a, a, a focus of theirs. If you if you have participated in research and you can talk about what you've done in 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 in, in um, a knowledgeable and enthusiastic way, I think that will go a long way. So. Um, it hasn't been the experience, my experience or those of other Hampshire graduates that I know that they're pretty successful at getting into graduate programs. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much. And plus, if you've already sent in the application, the ball's in their court. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and so Ava, our Weber has a kind of similar theme of a question and that's, um, do you have advice for undergrads on how to be successful physicists and feel motivated even without perfect grades? Yeah. Um, Yes, this is, this is, I did not have perfect grades <laughs> at any stage actually. Um, and so I think um, a lot of it and, and the bridge programs 
focus on this in particular is they're looking for someone's, they're really looking for those qualities of like um, really engaged in research and wanting to do research and um, showing tenacity and resilience in that. So um, if you can work with a professor at your institution during the year, apply to summer programs. Um, and then I've actually had a few students who didn't do super well as um, undergraduates in terms of grades. And then they um, you know, went to, um, got, a, got a master's degree um, at, and you could do that at bridge school or you could do that at a not bridge school. Um, and were able to improve their grades at that level. And then the graduate school is going to be much more interested, particularly if you point it out, you know, it's like, please look at my graduate grades, not my undergraduate grades and see that, um, you know, that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm capable. So there are lots of places, if you have setbacks, there are lots of places where you can um, regroup, so to speak, and, and, and then continue to make progress. And just one plug, I've had a long discussion about this with our grad admissions at GW and they've said if there's like one semester where you have a terrible time and your grades ditch and that's what kills your GPA, explain it in your application. Not, don't devote all of your personal statement to it, but having a little bit of an explanation can be enough that they then understand that semester and take into account the other grades and the other indications in your letters of, of support um, and give them more of a weight than the one semester where you had a tough time. Yeah. So we have another really interesting question. Do you think your experience as a junior engineer was helpful in the long run, or would you rather have gone right into the bridge program? Oh, it was um, the junior engineer experience was critical because that's where, first of all, I thought, yeah, maybe I do want to do this long term. Because I, I, at that point, I was like, oh, you have to understand. <laughs> I did not have like this, okay, I'm gonna be a physicist and that's what's gonna happen. Even after I graduated with a bachelor's in physics, I was like, oh, this guy's offering me a job. I don't have a job. Okay, you know, kind of, <laughs> it was like that about being a junior engineer. So, but it was after I was working as a junior engineer and being in the lab and seeing, again, really the social organization of the lab. I thought, if I ever wanna be the one making the decisions about what we're gonna do next, I need a PhD. And so I thought it doesn't, and still I wasn't really committed to physics. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I need to go to grad school. So rather than stay as a junior engineer, I'm gonna to go to grad school and, and check it out some more. And <laughs> so, and you know, eventually, obviously I really made the commitment, but that's another thing is, um, my mom said this to me once, she said, if you don't know what you wanna do, the last thing you wanna do is sit in a canoe in the middle of the lake. My mom was from a little, grew up on a little lake in Wisconsin, sit in a canoe in the middle of the lake and think about it. If that's not going to help, you've got to do something. And either you, that doing, that doing of that first thing works out really well, or you move on to something else, but do things to move it along. Yeah. So Grace Harley asks, and I think this is a very interesting discussion to have. Can you have a, can you talk a little about how to have a conversation with those who don't believe that imposter syndrome, stereotyping, sexism, et cetera, are legitimate things that occur. So I would highly recommend Claude Steele's book to, to you and to them. It's called Whistling Vivaldi. And the title is really interesting. Um, it comes from an interaction he had with a friend who is a graduate student, I don't remember in what discipline, at the University of Chicago. And the University of Chicago is in uh, right on the, the edge of um, a predominantly black community. And then there's the University of Chicago, Chicago, which is an integrated community and then more predominantly black community to the South. So they're kind of surrounded by predominantly black communities. And this was a, a black man, a, a, a big stature. And he, you know, found that he knew that, you know, people would, he'd be walking toward people and they'd cross the street, you know, white people. And so he knew that he made white people uncomfortable just, his, just in his being and particularly at night. And so what he would do is he was walking down the sidewalk, um, you know, really to protect himself from this, this bias that was all around him. He would whistle Vivaldi, whistle classical music. And that would signal to people, oh, he's actually one of us. You know, he's, he listens to classical music. He's an intellectual, you know, da, da, da. And then they remap him in their heads. And so that's, that's where the title comes from. So I'd say, 
um, you know, that would be the first thing. Just, just have them read. It's very readable. It's really interesting. So, and then Carol Dweck's book on fixed and growth mindset. Again, um, that's, you know, written, written for the pop, a popular viewer. It's not like reading it, uh, uh, a scientific paper. Um, so those, that's, that's where I would start. Those are both great books. The other question that I think is really interesting is, do you have recommendations on how to shift to a growth mindset? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, um, so I think one of them is, is, is really recognizing that discomfort that you feel and saying, okay, right now I feel terrible. I'm trying to do something. And believe me, I do this over and over again. It's like, this is too hard. I can't do this, right? It's like you're, you're working on a physics problem and it's just, it's just hard and you're not getting it. And that feels terrible. But your, your brain is actually working really hard, again, to shift this paradigm. It's some, there's something you don't know or you, un, are you, un, are you misunderstand it, but it's in your brain. You're, that's the way your brain is wired right at that minute. And you're actually gonna have to, if you're gonna have to let that wiring atrophy and build another pathway. So you're actually building a pathway as you struggle. Super hard to do in the moment. I wouldn't say necessarily when you wanna throw your pencil down that that's the moment you're like, no, no, I'm going to embrace a growth mindset, but rather that you you begin slowly just to say, I mean, I think of a muscle. I think thinking of a muscle is a good thing. So when you exercise, um, you know, and you get sore muscles, you haven't hurt them, um, and you're actually helping them to grow. So it. And, and so, and just do it, and, and just sort of, and another thing students have told me has been really helpful is like thinking about those boxes, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of stop thinking about the boxes. You're right. That's what, I, that's what I've always been doing. I've always been trying to get sorted into the smart box and to just try to try to blow up that image in your head, right? And say, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to get sorted into the smart box. I'm smart enough. What I'm trying to do is learn something I don't know that's hard. And then later I will know it. And I remember I had one professor and I would, he would, I would grapple with something for a long time. And I walk in and I'd say, I don't get this. And then he would explain it. And I would say, and then I would be embarrassed, like, oh, that's so trivial. And he goes, that's because you understand it now. It's not, <laughs> what, yeah, that now it's obvious because now you've got those neural pathways in place, but you had to go through that struggle. You didn't, you know, and I, I tell students that all the time when they come into office hours and they ask me a question. And then I, you know, we talk about it for a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes. Oh, that was such a stupid question. I go, no, all that work you did getting confused. If you had walked in here without having done that work, this explanation wouldn't work for you. You wouldn't understand it in one, particularly if, if I can clear it up in one sentence, then they've done a ton of work. Right. And so I, I always emphasize you did the work before you got here. All I did was I kind of all the pieces were there and we just need to move one puzzle piece around. Everything fell into place. But if you hadn't been working on the puzzle, it couldn't have happened. So I'm going to fold together a couple of questions. OK, <laughs> so one of the students asked, now that you're a dean, are you still doing physics? And if so, what kind? Tell us a little bit about your research. And someone else asked, what are some of the ways to keep the spark love of science alive? Mm -hmm despite the sometimes overwhelming burden of, of discrimination and inequality. So if you could. Yeah, yeah, okay. those are really good. So um, I guess I'm not doing physics research at this point. I'm really um, focused on pet physics pedagogy and particularly the impact of physics pedagogy on marginalized stu students from marginalized groups. So I'm still doing research, but not, um, not contributing to the body of physics knowledge, but more contributing to the body of physics as a social enterprise. Um, and there is, you know, you can you can actually get a PhD in physics education research if that's something that you're interested in. And um, the, you know, it took a while for the physics community to realize, oh, that's really part of physics. We need to be thinking about, um, you know, if there's, you know, when you think about physics. That, that, is the, that is the society, right? That is the, the community is, um, is having, having physics in people's brains and minds and then having them generate new, um, new knowledge in physics. Mm -hmm. So that's our fundamental enterprise. And the first half of it actually 
um, teaching physics, um, we ignored for a really long time. So that's, so my, my passion has kind of moved kind of the perfect melding of my passion for physics and the physics community and my passion for um, um, centering um, mar folks from marginalized groups in whatever enterprise we're a part of. So that's, that's where it is. And then how do you keep your spark alive? Yeah, in the face. So one thing is really to have a community. And one of the, you know, we were talking, Evie and I were talking earlier about QWIP being online this time and the things that we lost because they're online, just that feeling of, I can't tell you, that feeling of 200 undergrad women in physics, it just, it just it like pumps me up. I just it like, I can live on that energy for months, you know, just like, oh, wow, this is so great. On the other hand, depending on, you know, your, your own proclivities, that, that can be kind of an overwhelming environment and it can be, you might end up kind of sticking with the people you came with. Whereas here you're, you're putting in breakout rooms and you're chatting with people from Brazil. And, and so um, I think, you know, even a virtual community, maybe from the people you meet at QWIP and say, you know what, we're just gonna have coffee. We're gonna have a Zoom coffee once a month and talk about what we really love about physics rather than you could spend, a, you know, maybe make it two parts. First, you have your gripe session about all the ways in which your environment is not friendly to you. And then, but then you make a particular moment to switch and say, now we're gonna talk about something in physics that, that's exciting to us. You can have like a little book club. Um, yeah, but having community is really important. I think that's a fantastic note to end the plenary on. Uh, QWIP is certainly about building community. We can see from the chat that you guys are doing a great job. When we talk about building community, I missed an announcement earlier, and Kai and Ella will, will be in, I'll be in trouble if I don't remember. The first three of you to start a new discussion and engage will receive QWIP t-shirts. So I encourage you to go to, to the QWIP engage. And also by logging into engage, you will have access later to all of the slides and the presentations. That's also a question that's come up quite frequently. So you'll be able to listen to Dr. Mary James and many, many, many of the other speakers over and over again by joining in and engage and you have the opportunity to win t-shirts and the next session is one of the speaker chat sessions so just a reminder all of the speakers you can enter for the speaker chat sessions through the attendee portal so can all of the attendees tech folks please try and enter through the speaker portal but if that doesn't work you can go through the attendee portal too and i look forward to seeing all of you there thank you very much and thank you once again dr james for an absolutely incredible talk that really encouraged the QWIP students. Thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate your attending the talk. And thank you, Mary. It was fantastic.